Welcome, uh, and thank you for joining us for uh, another installment of the Carnegie Foundation series, Improvement Science in the Time of COVID-19. My name is Ash Vasudeva, Vice President for Strategic Initiatives at the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching. Uh, I'm here with uh, one of our iLEAD school systems and their School of Education partners. Uh, iLEAD is a series of 11 School of Education school system partnerships that are using improvement science to support uh, improvement leadership preparation and development. Uh, today, I'm with uh, uh, leaders from the Bronx, New York school system, Yonkers, New York school system, and Fordham University. Uh, I'd like to in have them each introduce themselves. We'll start with the Bronx uh, and go around the horn, and we'll come back uh, with uh, the first question uh, for how these systems and their partners are using improvement thinking in the response to COVID-19 uh, and their plans to reopen schools. So with that, I'd like to start with the Bronx. Good afternoon, I'm Misha Ross Porter and I'm the executive superintendent for the Bronx. Hello, I'm Krista Phillips. Uh, I'm the uh, director of the academic response team for the Bronx. Hi, I'm Andrea Cadet. I'm the Assistant Superintendent for Elementary Education for Yonkers Public Schools. Hi, I'm Terry Orr, and I'm Associate Professor in the Division of Educational Leadership Administration Policy at Fordham University. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Stosich, and I'm an Assistant Professor um, at Fordham in the Educational Leadership Division. I, I want to thank you all for making time to join us today, both the, the, the uh, five of you on the panel uh, and those of you who are watching. Uh, this is a pre-recorded session. Normally we take Q&A, uh, but not this time. Um, I want to begin, uh, Misha, in, in an in a earlier conversation, you framed the challenge of today uh, as the challenge of crisis leadership. C can you talk a little bit about crisis leadership and its connections to the uh, improvement science training and, and thinking that you've been engaged in with your partners at Fordham? Sure. So one of the things that I've thought a lot about, particularly as we serve um, the Bronx, is a community that's overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly disproportionately affected by so many things. I could make a long list. Um, and, and what I've thought about in this moment is that we've all often you know, the pandemic heightened the crisis that we were all already leading through. And what this time has offered us is the opportunity to kind of pause um, and really be thoughtful about like, how are we leveraging our tools? Um, how are we leveraging the practices of improvement science so that crisis leadership doesn't become like the, the norm, the way in which we operate? Um, because there's so many different types of crisis facing our communities that the pandemic really just heightened for us. Um, and so been, we've been really thinking a lot about um, how do we leverage improvement science to really identify what some of our real problems are, but also to tackle some smaller problems in order to address the, the bigger problems of our communities and, and our schools. Thank you. Um, Andrea, would you like to build on that from your perspective in Yonkers? Yes, um, certainly. So when the um, COVID crisis hit, uh, initially, uh, the thought was, okay, let's figure out what the problem is. Let's um, develop some solutions for the problem and let's implement those solutions and see how they're working. So one thing we, re we quickly realized was that we didn't have one solution. We didn't have one problem. We had multiple problems of practice situated within this whole uh, COVID crisis. And each problem of practice required um, an intervention that was not necessarily, um, it was interdependent with the other interventions, right? And uh, many of the people that we actually uh, tapped to help solve the problems of practice were needed to solve multiple problems of practice. So here you have um, multiple problems of practices, you have multiple interventions, you have multiple um, improvement cycles, right? So your plan, do, study, act, each one of your problems had a different PDSA cycle. However, you're all geared towards one thing. And one thing we did learn was that 
sort of you you learned what everybody's skill set was so you may have a certain title and role but you may have a skill set suited to something else so we quickly learned that we could tap um as central office administrators parents students um your CSEA workers, your clericals, your um, teachers, and they weren't necessarily um, serving in the role that was their title. They were serving where the need was so that we can have um, rapid cycles, right, of, of improvement. And we had to constantly monitor and make adjustments. The sort of, you know, we hear the term building the plane while flying. Well, we were building multiple planes, right? Trying to land in one airport of safety and education for the kids. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, Misha, you and Andrea have really uh, painted a picture of uh, not a singular COVID-19 problem, but a, a, a series of multiple problems that pre-existed COVID-19 that COVID-19 has added to. Uh, social unrest and, and, and tension has exacerbated as well. Uh, um, and, and you've also talked about a dynamic response that sort of sits outside of people's particular job titles or roles. That is, how do you engage the expertise for many people in many new ways to respond to those multiple problems? Uh, Chris, what does this look like for you? You know, as, as someone who's trying to do the academic response team in the Bronx, you have a clear uh, set of goals and ideas for how to achieve it. Uh, how, how did this, the frame that, that Misha and uh, Andrew described, relate to your work on that academic response team? Yeah, so we were uh, pretty uniquely set up um, to re respond to this crisis. I mean, we've been responding to, to the crisis of um, inequities all year, and that's sort of how we framed our, our entire work. Um, and we, we were able to pivot really quickly just because uh, this, this, uh, our, our work is, is so contextually unique that you can really pinpoint one particular area within a school that, that needs support, that needs, needs um, you know, just a little bit of help. Uh, and and, and so, so we were able to do that pretty, pretty quickly. Uh, our, our support is, is uh, rapid, you know, it's a six to eight week cycle, just like what, um, what, what I, um, Andrew was, was uh, saying. So we were, we were able to really get in there um, with, with, with a quick uh, adaptation um, and, uh, and, and target some of those things. And, and uh, to uh, Misha's point, you know, we, we, um, th this, this crisis on, on every level has just, um, has, has really exposed those, those inequities that are, that, that are, that are present. And, because of that, that, that exposure, we were really able to, to dig in and, and attack those, those points in a, in a school system or, or a larger system where inequities were brewing and um, you know, where, where inequities kind of grow. Um, so, so, so we were able to really pivot quickly, help schools in a very strategic way, in a very unique way to each individual school. That's the, that's the great thing about, about improvement science is that you can help schools and, and, and help school leaders think through their, their problems in ways that really are targeted to them and their school community and their school culture. Um, so we were able to, to really quickly identify those, those, those areas and help them there. Thank you, thank you. Uh, you talk about how the, uh, all three of you have, have talked about how the existing inequities have been surfaced and, 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 and sharpened and, and they're very clear now, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, in the time of COVID. And you're, can you talk a little bit about how these improvement structures and processes you have in place uh, have helped you address them in, 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 in fundamental ways? Um, for example, some might say, this isn't the time for structured processes and uh, uh, approaches. We don't have time for that. We need to uh, deal with the urgency of now. Uh, and yet, I think you're, you're using a, a system that you have in place uh, in, in ways to get at these inequities. Just tell me a little bit about how these processes uh, are, are guiding the work that you do day to day. Misha, if you want to maybe just start with that. Well, I think the urgency of now could lead to further inequities down the road. And so if we approach um, this moment, right, and there are things we have to solve, right? Like some technical things, right? When we went into um, closure, students still needed to eat. 
right? So we, we don't have time to take that through the PDS PDSA cycle, right? We got to figure out how we're going to get lunch, right? We, that, that is, that we had to solve that, right? But remote learning, scheduling, programming, right? Ensuring that we don't create and, and further exacerbate inequities, providing access to resources, internet, Wi-Fi um, in every community, um, those take time. They, th that takes us to be really thoughtful, strategic, and adaptive. Shifting a system from in-person instruction to a fully remote, blended learning hybrid model, if we don't stop and really think about one, which problem, which, which of this, which of the big, which parts of the big problem we're trying to solve and really go through a process to identify the unintended consequences connected to solving that problem, then, you know, to, to my earlier thinking about like this idea of crisis leadership and always operating from that space, right? And it being further exacerbated by this moment, we will further deepen the inequities that exist in our community. So I think we, we this is the moment to really in fact be intentional, right? Like we are very, I'm very worried. I'm sure we all are. Um, there's not a student in this world, right? Not the Bronx, not New York City, not Yonkers, not this country, right? There's not a student in the world that isn't currently a SIFE student, a student with interrupted formal education. And it doesn't matter whether they attend the highest performing school or if they are, right? Every student is in that place. And so if we aren't intentional about how we solve this, the small problems that live within our larger crisis, then we are going to really deeply affect a generation. Right. And, and I'll, I, I, I would just piggyback on what um, Misha said. So it just brings me to the point about attending to variability, right? Mm -hmm. So we used to think of SAIF students as students who came from another country, mm -hmm. right? Um, but now we're all here and, and, and all of our students are SAIF. Mm -hmm. And so we have had a lot of variability that we had to attend to. You have students with devices and students without devices. You have students with devices and no internet connection or, or unreliable internet connection. You have your general education students, your special education students, your multilingual learners. Um, you have your students, uh, your demographic groups for, um, which have who, for whom schools were identified according to every student's um, succeeds act uh, as a school of accountability. And layered upon that, you have your families who are affected, who may be affected because of their job, because somebody they know had COVID, because they don't have access to food. And we are trying to solve the problem for people who are affected with people who are affected. So we're all affected in some way with, uh, by COVID. But we also have to work within that parameter of being affected by COVID and helping to solve the problem. So I thought that was a, another attention to variability that the people you need to solve the problem are also people who are affected by the problem. Mm -hmm. So that's a variability that uh, I think this, this uh, COVID-19 crisis brought to light. Can, can I just add in there too? Um, so, so our approach in the Bronx has, has, has always been that, you know, about variability. And so what, what we've done all, all year um, which really carried over into into remote learning and, and our and our present crisis is try to support schools in, in sort of a, a a a two rail way of the same tracks right so one of those rails is all about um, helping schools attack that immediate problem that they're focusing and, and for us it was it was problems of disproportionality and and equity um, and, and so we did that over a six to eight week period we we, we would infuse um you know and and use the uh the um, improvement science process the other rail of that support uh was to really create a culture shift and a, and a shift in in how that school thinks about their own organizational learning and their own ways of knowing and this current crisis that 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 we're in we can really think about how education looks different for our students and, and, and what students get out of it. And, and that, while we are attending to the immediate problems that are both um, technical and, and adaptive, uh, we can really look at shifts in what we're doing 
and, and, and how we are supporting our, our students um, through that whole process, just by getting folks to think a little bit differently about what it means to be in education and what it means to actually support schools. Thank you, thank you. I, I, I wanna, um, I, I'm gonna ask one more question then turn to our, our, our friends from Fordham University to get their perspectives on this. Uh, but before I make that shift, I, 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 I've been hearing very loud and clear that, that there is an adaptability and flexibility that's getting called upon that is, is required to respond to this, the problems of now. And, and those ways of thinking then are helping think about what education could look like in the future. It's, it's, it's solving the immediate problem and creating a set of habits and orientations that would rethink the system going forward. That's what I'm taking from this. Can you talk about, before we go to Fordham, just hypothetically, what are you, you know, how are you doing work now that's informed by your improvement? You've been talking about that. What would it look like without this, without this perspective, this preparation, the, the ways that you've sort of integrated improvement into your responses? So before improvement, we might have responded to COVID-19 like this. Mm -hmm. After improvement, we respond to it in this new way, different way. Could you just give a few examples of what this would look, what you think this might have looked like with absent the improvement work that you've been doing? I think we would have just jumped to solutions. And I think that the jumping to solutions doesn't allow you the time to really process to really identify what the real problems are you are trying to solve. And, you know, under every big problem, there are a lot of layers of really small problems to, to all of these pieces, right? Um, our governor just announced about an hour ago that we're going to be able to go back to school, right? And so, great. Now we have that answer. We got the answer. Everybody's been waiting for it. But that answer opens a whole can of worms, right? And so I think pre-improvement, we would be just like, all right, so now we got to get that checklist going for the reopening list. Um, and I think post-improvement, we are like, let's take pause. Let, like, I, let's identify what we need to solve for, right? Let us identify what our actual problem is that we are trying to solve and really focus on solving that problem instead of, you know, attacking all of these pieces. Um, and then I think, you know, one of the things that we would not have thought about is, you know, kind of the outcomes in advance, right? We would think about the solution as opposed to, um, you know, you know, to school reopening, right? Like, let's just get the programs done, right? And let's get this thing moving. Um, we wouldn't think about it's not just getting the programs done, it's what in fact we actually want to happen, have happened as a result of school opening and what exactly we wanna ensure for. And we wanna ensure for students engaging in quality instruction. We wanna take care of their social emotional health and well being. And to Andrea's point, we wanna take care of the adults who are responsible for taking care of the children who are affected by the problem that we are all trying to solve. And so I think it gives, it, it also gives us space to really sit in that adaptive space and really unpack with a level of empathy and understanding for all of those who are affected in this moment. Right, and I would agree with uh, Misha. And um, when I think about, pre, right, so pre-COVID, we move, I mean, pre-improvement science, it's about solutions. I find what improvement science does, it helps you to see the system much more quickly. So you see the system and you see the problem that you're trying to solve much more quickly. So for example, um, when Misha talked about um, attending to social emotional and attending to making sure that children get this rigorous instruction. So then how are we building our schedules? Are we scheduling in time for social emotional learning? When we say that we have social emotional learning, are we gonna do an exit ticket in that time? So I think not. 
because then that is not um, geared towards the outcome of student well-being. So we have to think about if we set aside time for social emotional learning, what are the key levers that we need to have in place that are actually going to allow students to talk, uh, have, um, I won't say an unstructured conversation, but, but give space for people to um, voice their feelings. And the other thing I've heard um, is about the loss of learning. How are we going to um, verify or check the loss of learning? Well, what exactly is it that you're trying to check? What is the loss that you're trying to verify? You can't verify loss of learning unless you know what you're trying to measure. So are you trying to measure the March to June skills? Are you also measuring how um, uh, the students' foundational skills as in power standards that they will need to um, approach the rigorous work? Because if you are, then you will build a measurement tool that measures your March to, Ju to June and your power standards as opposed to just giving the kids a diagnostic test seeing what happens, and then you draw this bullseye around the outcome and saying, okay, that's what we were, we were hoping for, right? So that's what uh, I think intentional and purposeful leadership really it, with improvement, with the improvement science lens speaks to. And, and to, to both of those points, um, this, this, this approach of, of improvement science really is a, a, a human one. At its at its core, I, I mean that's that's where it's at, and and it places the 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 user, um, in our case st students, at the center of it, and and what what is most important to them ends up being what's most important to the organization, and the school and the, and the and the collective, um, you know, and and just one more point on it to to to, to add to both of those is that, um, I think, uh, you know, post improvement science, uh, it's allowed us to actually be more efficient. Um, because you can fail fast and you can you can learn quickly from your mistakes as opposed to just kind of you know throwing things up against the wall and and hoping one of them works and and maybe it will maybe it won't but because it's such a a, a context specific and, and strategic approach um it it, it, it has it, it has allowed us you know prior to covid but also during this 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 time um to really fail quickly. So there were times that, that we were supporting schools where we were doing something and, and we learned really fast that that, that wasn't going to work. Uh, and um, we were able to pivot, figure out where we went wrong and uh, make those, those proper adjustments and, and, and go back and end up being more successful. Um, and, and just that mindset that, you know, it, it's okay to fail and, and you can learn from it and you can um, use those failings as, 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 an, as an understanding of, of you know, uh, what 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 in your measurements went went wrong, um, and how can you make it better? So so I think it's made us more human and more more efficient um, during these last few months. Th thank you. That's a really wonderful description. Uh, I I think the the fight against solutionitis. You're 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 winning that fight. There's not a single solution, and understanding deeply the problem from the perspective of of the user. Uh, very clear uh, in your talking, the improvement frame uh, and, and seeing the system uh, and working within the system to understand the problem uh, and being adaptive and flexible. Uh, really powerful way of thinking about your approaches to this work. And, and uh, in part, that connection uh, goes as a through line to Fordham University and, uh, uh, and the partnership that you all have. Um, uh, uh, Terry and Elizabeth, uh, as you uh, uh, hear uh, the school leaders from the, the, the Bronx and Yonkers talk about this work, uh, can you talk about how uh, your role uh, in both developing uh, the, the improvement approaches and ideas uh, and supporting them in this time of COVID-19? Uh, yes, yeah, thanks, Ash. And I would love to build on what they were talking about and in two ways. One, what we had to do within Fordham um, because we were impacted as well in terms of our programs. Um, and then to our work as part of a partnership through iLEAD. So in terms of our programs, um, like the Bronx school districts and Yonkers school districts, we had to quickly move uh, to what we call emergency response, response teaching, like quickly put all our courses online. Um, 
and you know as the best way we could kind of so there was continuity and our, our initial wondering was like well you know with everything all our students have because they mm -hmm. themselves are doing what Nisha and Andrea and Chris were doing which is supporting mm -hmm. others in continuing schooling would they even want to continue in their classes and so and what we learned very quickly is they really needed the chance to stop and reflect, to step back and be in conversations with each other about what was going on and how they were handling it and, and to have a space to step away and, and, and just sort of debrief a little bit. And increasingly what we also found across our student groups is that the, whatever was being discussed in the courses was substantively useful to helping them reflect on the problems that they were having, be it about, about leadership or about urban issues or um, things like that, so that it gave them also a way in to sort of step back even further to reflect on what they were doing. Um, what we also learned with our students and in, in working with um, our district partners is not only does it open up the severity of the crises that for which we need to prepare our leaders better to address, but it also showed that there are opportunities for creativity, that we don't have to think about how do we do what we've always been doing within the, the, this, this new constraint, but the new constraint all opens up a chance to work differently and to think about how we can try to use that more. And we've, <clears throat> we've learned like as everything's gone online, meetings have gone online, well then more people can come to meetings or we can meet differently as we meet together. And so we've learned that both in um, working with the, the NICs that we're, we've helped support in the Bronx and in Yonkers and learned with our students in, as they've tried out new endeavors. Um, it's also helped us think more about what we what's feasible for us to do together during this time and um and also to continue to pursue what's a priority for us and and one has been to continue to work on thinking about how to form NICs and use NICs among um principals and assistant principals in both the bronx and in yonkers um, but also working with misha in the bronx we have formed a cohort of, of mid-career professionals who want to pursue their doctorate. And what we've learned is this crisis has created such enthusiasm for people who want to make a difference, who, who themselves have the passion of, that these issues have brought to the fore. Um, it's, it's, it's really pushed us hard to say, okay, we're going to run a doctoral program with these people. We've really got to stay up with them because they're going to run ahead of us. Um, and so, uh, Misha, you know, my hat's off to you for the people you've been able to recruit because um, the passion and the desire to tackle the problems that she and Andrea and Chris have talked about is so profound. Um, and to be able to be part of um, a doctoral program that is going to take this on is humbling. Thank you, Terry. Yeah, I totally agree. I'm, you know, I'm on my toes for this semester and year ahead. Um, you know, and I think I really appreciated Ash your question about sort of how are we, you know, as leaders in higher education as well, thinking about this work that is different than how we might have pre-improvement science. And, you know, through the process of working in partnership with, um, you know, the Bronx and Yonkers and um, leaders in um, Mamaroneck and elsewhere, you know, we've really changed the way we think about preparing leaders and and pre preparing leaders of improvement. And it really is similar to what, um, you know, you all have talked about in leading school systems. So like Misha talking about sort of, you know, the idea of just thinking about is the program there? Are we doing the program or rushing to solutions? In the past, you know, as professors, we were really bringing our ideas, our solutions, our areas of expertise. And students were often bringing their sort of passion projects, right? And in redesigning the program and integrating improvement science and really working in partnership, um, you know, with, you know, our district leader partners, we've been thinking, you know, we're actively questioning how do you develop leaders of improvement? And the biggest lesson is you make their problems 
the center of the learning right? The center of the work. And so, you know, these are, you know, what Misha called big problems, right? So they've identified big problems and the focus has been on identifying equity-minded problems of practice. And so they were already grappling with these long enduring inequities um, before this crisis hit. And so, you know, for us, as professors supporting their learning and development and for their work as leaders who are, um, you know, continuing to learn and develop, there's not just a big pivot that's happened given the, you know, new challenges posed by COVID. There's really, you know, there's maybe some different sort of small problems within that bigger problem that they're tackling and, you know, more, um, maybe failures that are coming even faster. Um, but like Terry was saying, there's just a real urgency. And, um, you know, I think we're just happy that they can bring that into the classroom and that we can try to do our very best to support them because, you know, these are incredibly um, urgent and important issues that they're tackling. Thank you, Terry and Elizabeth. I think this is a wonderful parallelism uh, that you're, you're not pushing programs on emerging, uh, on school leaders uh, uh, in the same way they're not pushing programs. We're trying to understand the problem and, and, and be adaptive in how we solve that problem together. And it strikes me as that orientation uh, and the kind of leadership that we see uh, in, in these systems uh, helps account for the uh, uh, excitement of, uh, you know, the new students who are coming into the program when they see this orientation that, that, that Yonkers and, and Fordham and the Bronx have together to solve these problems. I, I think um, it's very powerful. Um, uh, and, and an example of how partnerships can create better systems in ways of thinking and, 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 and attacking the kinds of enduring problems we face. Now, now, I'd love for you to take a minute, for all of you to take a minute and, and, and think about what successes have you had in this March through July, August period. Like, what, what have you had that you think, you know, we did this well. We may have failed quickly and learned from it, Chris, as you brought up, or because we were attentive to the problem and not pushing a program, we were able to do something. Could you just reflect on some successes you've had uh, and then some enduring challenges you, you, you're facing as you enter the year ahead? So Misha, you wanna kick us off? I mean, I think, I think our early success was, you know, we, the first problem when we went into remote learning was how are we going to grade students? Um, and, you know, the, the first understanding was how we would have to begin, one, how much policy would be coming out changing and how we would have to unpack it. Um, and I think our first success was really around unpacking the grading policy keeping in mind the community we serve and the realities of the disproportionality of access in the Bronx. And so how we approach that problem, how we um, communicated the policy to our principals by really framing it in scenarios um, as opposed to just delivering the policy, right? So when we talked earlier about what would you have done pre-improvement, post-improvement, Pre-improvement, we would have gotten the policy, we would have passed it along, right? Post-improvement, we got the policy, we unpacked it internally with our superintendents. We thought about specific students um, who would be affected by it. We thought about the different variations around how students were experiencing remote learning. And with that, we were able to roll out the policy with conditions practices, beliefs, and understandings on how it would be experienced by students, right? And so we didn't, um, you know, to, to really thinking about how, who is the user, right? And who is going to, you know, experience this, right? Like we're going to deliver a grade, but, you know, 10th grade Jaden is going to experience a grade. And so how are we going to roll out the policy, keeping 10th grade Jaden in mind, as opposed to teacher, English teacher, Misha Porter in mind who has to create a grade. And so I think that was one of our really early successes. Um, and remember, we have 300 plus schools. And so we had, to ro we had to roll out a common understanding and belief to 300 schools. Um, and I, I think we did a really good job in the team members here at the borough office, our APAs, 
um, you know, really helped unpack that, create and build the scenarios. Um, and it changed the way our folks experience policy. Thank you. A Andrea? We were able to build a learning platform uh, uh, for each grade level, and we were able to uh, provide work there for families who were not able to, uh, who didn't have internet access or weren't able to access learning, whether if it was synchronous. So I think that is something that we did uh, remarkably well, but it also uh, pinpointed challenges, right? We also had to put into effect a system that um, provided families with print copies. And we had a system all set up that we had a certain day or dates that we would distribute the print copies. And then everything was shut down. And we couldn't even open to distribute print copies. We quickly, as I, I liked um, Chris's term, we quickly had to pivot uh, because the parents were still um, asking for print copies. So we opened up a hotline and we also had an online version. And within a couple of days, we had over a thousand requests. So we had this nice little system, we'll get our requests. Well, we had um, people who volunteered to come in, put them together, we'll put it in the mail, they'll get them. But we also learned that, okay, so we are go working with print shop. Print shop can only print a certain number of copies. Um, we're working with a, um, a mail system that requires you to have money on your mail meter to print uh, or to, to mail. So we, we learned very quickly from that, but we also learned how, how do we use internal systems? How do we use people? We had many people who rose to the occasion and we were able to see um, exemplars what should this look like across the board um, if we were to enter a remote setting? What does um, an exemplary um, synchronous, what does exemplary synchronous, synchronous learning look like at all levels? Because at the high school level, it's going to look like one thing, middle school, one thing, elementary and early learning, um, it looks totally different. And, uh, you know, we also had to learn that we have different platforms that's one thing we learned. Um, and they're all good for certain things, but every, but one platform is not good for everything. So we, but we were able to um, figure it out in such a way that we met the needs of most. Um, do we have a lot more work to do? Absolutely. Because meeting the needs of most is not meeting the needs of all. And we said no child left behind. So, and we still believe that. Chris, your thoughts on this? Sure. Um, so I, I, I could talk about our successes just as easily as I can talk about our, our failures. Um, so uh, I, I, I think, um, you know, we, we've had some, some really good successes and, you know, in, in spite of uh, some of the craziness that has happened over the last few months, it, I think it's taught us a lot about um, how we can use uh, um, um, improvement science to, to, to attack not just you know, issues that are kind of longstanding or, or root, you know, root cause, but to, to our earlier conversation, crisis, you know, um, management and, and uh, crisis leadership um, uh, uh, issues. So, um, you know, and, and I, I don't want to get too ahead of myself, but, but, I, but I think that our, our um, so, so my, our small art team uh, that supported, you know, a handful of schools throughout the year, uh, completed two cycles of support throughout the year. And, and I think actually that's the second cycle, which was done at least halfway um, uh, remotely, um, was probably more successful than our first cycle, just because, um, you know, there was a real crisis there. Folks saw the urgency and we were able to really use the process in, in a way that was that was um, uh, really purposeful and, and really strategic. Um, and, and uh, you know, it, it's also forced us to be innovative, um, as a, as a team and as a, as a borough, uh, you know, it was forced us to, to think outside of our older ways of, of doing things and just come up with, with, with some new ways, uh, which is not always a bad thing. Um, you know, just even as a, as a small team, we thought a lot about how our, how our own data uh, is uh, collected and, and uh, you know, how to, how to turn some of that, you know, we, we, we had mounds of qualitative data 
um, and we were able to to change some of that over to uh, quantitative data, and and that was that was good. We we started a podcast. I, I don't know. We were doing things that we wouldn't normally do, and uh, you know, just sort of really being uh, you know thinking outside the box. And um, we also were able to leverage our our community based partnerships um, in 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 new ways that 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 we hadn't done before, and and they uh, gained a great interest in, in uh, the, the, the process of improvement science to, you know, um, to, to, to attack issues of, of uh, equity. And, and we were able to really capitalize on that too. So um, it, it's, been a, it's been a whirlwind of, a, of the last few months, um, but, I, but, but I think having a focus and being committed to it, which, which is a testament to, to the leadership of, uh, of um, Ms. Uh, Misha Ross Porter, uh, is, it has, has really allowed us to, uh, to uh, grow. And, um, and, and ultimately help students during this, during yeah. this time. Thank you. I'm, I'm gonna sort of pose a question to, to the, the, the Fordham colleagues that we have here. Uh, I'm gonna add to that question just a little bit, and then I'm gonna try to round it out with the, the voices of practice uh, at the end. But, but before I put, put, put the question to Fordham, uh, I, I just think your, your responses were so powerful. Um, Chris, you talked about sort of the new kinds of connections and opportunities that were made available, things you might not have done without the crisis and you were, you were, you were acting in new ways. And I think Terry had talked a little bit about uh, uh, how it, it unleashed some creativity uh, 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 in, in approaches, which is very powerful. Uh, Andrea, the, the adaptability and flexibility of your systems uh, to, to address problems and, and uh, uh, see things that sit underneath problems, whether it's mailing and distribution and, and access. Uh, uh, again, very powerful example of, of getting to know the system and the underlying problems of how those two are coupled. Uh, and Misha, that the idea that policy, not as an edict from on high, but understood through the, 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 the light lived experiences of users. That's a very powerful and, and important frame that, that you're bringing not only to this conversation, but as you said, to 300 plus schools. Uh, remarkable. Um, Terry and Elizabeth, uh, uh, just as you reflect on some of the successes and enduring challenges from where you sit uh, at Fordham, would love those thoughts, but I'd like to add one more. Advice for your higher ed colleagues. Uh, you all have had a, a partnership uh, uh, with many New York districts, I including the Bronx and Fordham. But, but what advice would you give to your higher ed colleagues based on your improvement partnership uh, with the, the New York City school system? So uh, I'll turn it to you, Terry. Uh, and then when you guys are done, I'm going to go back to advice for our, our, our K-12 leaders uh, that, that you all would have. So please, Terry. So just to finish up on the earlier question that you asked about what we've learned. Um, and I want to state the obvious. We've all learned how to use Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> and for better or for worse, um, we've all become actually quite comfortable in using Zoom. I mean, I know we all complain about too many Zoom meetings and Zoom, Zoom brain and all that stuff. But what I found is that we are much, we meet more easily now. We plan, we do problem solving. Um, we have meetings that are much more comfortable and happen more easily on Zoom than we ever, ever would have pre-Zoom. And it means that we can, we create community quite quickly and easily in ways that we've never had done before. Um, and so Chris knows this because he's been part of writing a proposal with some of the other iLead partners with people that have never worked together before as a team. And yet we were able to do that and that would never have happened. So it was a way we could work as partners and partners with others. The, other, the second thing is learning about, and, and everyone's touched on this, but it's the attention to, to others. Because we can now use Zoom and create conversations, we can check in and see how are people doing and we can see how are people doing. Um, or what I learned from some students, is they don't get to see, which is, a, which is a cautionary note too, because parents won't let their kids turn their videos on because they don't want people to see. And it gives you like early insight, but we were able to offer forums for our students to meet and talk with each other. And where we learned that we have to be sure, as Andrea said, attend to the social emotional part of all of this, along with the more technical, how are we gonna run our classes? Um, in terms of advice for higher ed, I'd go back to the, what 
Elizabeth stressed, which is, I think the power of our program has been to really learn how to put our district's work at the center. Our students are mid-career professionals working on very complex situations and problems and, and have opportunities for innovation. And if we can use our coursework as a way of framing that and investigating that together, we not only learn with each other, particularly the theory to practice connections, but also the power of networking, which is I think the last pillar of improvement science, um, which is how we can accelerate our learning and find solutions together. Our curriculum provides a framework to say, let's look at it from this perspective or this perspective, um, but it's the substance of what everyone's dealing with that allows us to understand the theory to practice connection. So to me, the success of our program comes from having the partners we have in the Bronx with Yonkers and with Mamaroneck um, that has enabled us to really think through how do we do this, but not as a one, like a point in time, but as an ongoing learning experience. Elizabeth. Yeah, and I think, you know, like what Chris mentioned, I think one thing we're viewing as a success in our, for our program is that, um, you know, rather than people feeling like they have to, you know, step back from their doctoral work or they, you know, have to put their dissertation and practice on hold or they're, you know, um, hesitant to start the program, right? They're, you know, the fact that there's sort of this heightened interest and this, you know, just incredible passion and urgency that they're bringing to their work, you know, to me that signals that we've done something right um, and that we're using improvement science to really bring these authentic um, and incredibly important um, problems of practice to the center of their learning, that they're able to do their work um, with the support of their colleagues and faculty and, um, you know, new learnings as part of their studies, you know, that's a signal to us that this, you know, that we're doing something right. And, you know, to be honest, you can do improvement science with an overly, you know, with too much focus on process, right? Um, the processes are helpful, right? You know, you're continuing to use them even in a time of great challenge like this, but it only is, you know, they're only useful when the focus remains on the problems and designing the solutions that are right for our children, right? Users, the, the student. I really appreciate it, Michelle. You talked about how will he, this one child, how will he experience this grading policy, right? Let's think, let's start with him in mind and then design around that, right? Rather than simply delivering this policy and not and thinking, you know, often too much as, about ourselves as adults um, and not enough about the children um, we're here to serve. And so, you know, advice for higher education partners, you know, like Chris mentioned, this requires a dramatic culture shift, which arguably is a much bigger culture shift for higher education than it is for pre-K-12. We collaborate a lot. We leave, you know, we've got, you know, egos we have to leave at the door. Um, and we show up with questions for our partners. You know, I think we have incredible, profound respect for our practice partners. We're very lucky um, to be able to work with them. And we, you know, bring ideas and questions to the table and design around them because we really, you know, we are, you know, the you're our clients, right? The children you serve and the adults who do the work, you know, that's who we need to be thinking about. Those are, you know, the users we need to keep in mind. And so by working in partnership over time um, and doing so in a really collaborative fashion, I think we've been able to integrate improvement science in authentic ways. You know, it's also an ongoing process, obviously. There's plenty to learn and we continue to do so. Um, but, you know, that's, I would argue like opposite of the norm in higher education. And so to do this work and not have it be about, you know, teaching people about some tools and some processes and really have it be, you know, a, become a space where great learning is happening about important real challenges, right? And action is happening as well um, requires a very different approach. 
Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Terry. I, I, it's clear to me from your description in this conversation that the, the work you do is not an academic exercise. It's actually an exercise in, in constructive problem solving with your partners and, and placing their problems at the center. And uh, uh, what, a, what, a, what a gift that is for higher ed and, and, and uh, uh, K-12 systems to work in that way. Um, I, I want to um, give our, 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 our K-12 leaders sort of a, the, the last sort of set of suggestions for other leaders, uh, uh, their peers and colleagues in New York and across the country. Uh, I'd like to flip the order a little bit. Uh, Chris, you might kick us off. Andrea and then Misha see us out of today's webinar. And uh, there will be a couple others with other systems, but uh, Chris, what would your suggestions be? Sure. Um, so, so I would, uh, so, you know, uh, there are a lot of people who know a lot more than I do uh, about this. One of them is, is uh, Dr. Luis Gomez, uh, who we actually had on the on the podcast uh, as a, as as a guest. And and his his so I'll just quote him. Uh, he he said to just 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 jump in, and and just do it, and 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 just try it out. Um, and, and you know, you just have that have that will and skill. Um, you know, com you have to com you have to combine those uh, where, where where you want to have to do this, where there's a mindset shift. Um, and and uh, also have the the, the uh, skills to do it. And I would also just add that, you know, um, this is a this is an opportunity for us to really uh, uh, rethink uh, um, how education can can operate and and how education can you know what it what it means for our students um, and and what what the, what the purpose is. And I and I think that um, you know we're really going to address issue, uh, um, issues of equity and racism and, and bias, um, improvement science is a, is, a, is a great place to start to really drill down on, on how the, each of those manifest themselves in unique ways in, in each school community. Um, so as a, as, a, as a school leader, uh, um, using improvement science to, to, to really drill down on that is a, is a really great way um, and efficient way to, to raise the, the contextual unique uh, ways that, that, that those um, uh, uh, horrible, horrible things um, manifest themselves um, and, and, and impact the lives of our students. Um, so, so, I, so I would say take this opportunity to really, you know, we always talk about disrupting and dismantling and interrupting uh, inequitable systems. Well, a lot of it's been dismantled. Uh, it's a good time for us to rebuild um, in, in equitable ways now that are purposeful and strategic. Thank you. Andrea. Yes, I would. I would um, would like to say. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that learning occurs in all contexts, right? So whether it's the intended learning or the unintended learning, learning will always take place. I guess our challenge is to ensure that the learning that has taken place is actually the intended um, learning, and. There's, there's something to be said about growth. So certainly I think three years ago, when we started our partnership with Fordham and iLead, we had a conceptual um, outcome that we wanted to um, see to fruition. And I really believe that the outcomes that we are seeing now as partners are uh, far exceed what was written on the paper. And it has, uh, our, our partnership has evolved and we've gone through several different iterations, but um, we have some meaningful um, outcomes right here, some which were intended and some which were unintended. And it comes with also some persistence, right? Um, so the, so I'm, I'm very um, fixed on outcomes and then are our outcomes explicit? Have we explicitly stated what they are? And as I said before, we can't measure our progress unless we know what our outcomes will be. It's not enough to draw a bullseye around the outcome and say, yep, we, we, we hit our target. And the other thing um, we've been alluding to is bringing people in. And we have to find out who's at the table and what is being served. If we are more concerned with how things look than how things are, then we are never going to get to the root of a problem 
and design a solution that is going to um, reach the intended outcome. And the people at the table are not just people who agree with us. There, there should also be people who don't agree with us. The voice of dissent helps guide us and really helps us refine our processes. So that's something that we as educators need to think about. Who's at the table, what's being served? And what are our iterative cycles of reflection and response? We have to continuously reflect on what we're doing and make our adjustments. Our, our response should not be, oh no, this is not so. It's okay, we see that this is so, wasn't our intended outcome. Uh, we like it, we don't like it, we'll make our adjustments. So we have to be constantly monitoring and adjusting, even as leaders. And lastly, um, this is our time of reckoning to decide what is learning and how do we know. And that one, I'm just going to leave on the table. Thank you. Well, the table is full. <laughs> <laughs> You put a lot There's on the table. Always there. room, always room at the table. Um, so my advice would just be to see the possibilities and potential in this moment. Um, mm -hmm. A crisis can either be that, or it can be an opportunity for us to do something new. Mm -hmm. And in education, right, we have been reforming, reforming, reforming. Well, guess what? Now we have no choice. Um, we absolutely have to reform the system. We've been forced into a moment. And I just really encourage people to really see the potential and possibilities in this moment. And what an exciting time it is to rethink education, to rethink what we want our students to experience. Um, and to really reimagine what school should look like. Nothing will ever replace in-person learning. But oh, what an opportunity this is to really think about how you enhance in-person learning and how learning extends out of the four walls of the school or out of the four walls of a classroom. Um, and you know what we shouldn't be thinking about is how we get back to normal. We should be thinking about how we shape a new normal. So that is what I will add to Andrea's lovely table. Yes. Well, uh, I, I want to thank all of you for being part of uh, this session today and sharing your insight and wisdom, which I, I think uh, helps us all frame this crisis, which is an absolute crisis, as an opportunity to rethink, reshape, and see the possibility in the future of education in the ways that you're doing together informed by your improvement partnership. Uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you and the other 10 systems uh, and their partnerships through iLead. Uh, and I know that we'll create great things together as, as you will too. So I wanna thank you today uh, and hope you'll, all of you watching this will join us for the other three other webinars on this series on improvement science in the time of COVID-19. Bye-bye.